Wanted to see what would grow and what wouldn't grow. We're at about 2,900 feet. It's actually a greater revelation. Somehow I think our Father has a purpose in all of this. One of his purposes is to keep us in the Word. But what we're trying to show people is that they can actually do this. And I know they can because we're doing it. Tom, this is a comment that came in. Tom, I listened to your last video, your latest video. As always, thank you for sharing. Thank you for this comment. I love to, to hear that kind of thing right out, right out of the gate. I am not agreeing with those raised from the grave. So this this is the last few videos we've been talking about, the first fruits and so on. So we'll explain a little bit more of that as we go to explain this, uh, this dilemma that we find ourselves in. I'm not agreeing with those raised from their graves when Yeshua was that they went to New Jerusalem. So let's put some setting into this, shall we? In chapter 27, in chapter 27 of Matthew, it tells us that when Yeshua died, the veil of the temple down in downtown Jerusalem, the veil of the temple, was torn in two from top to the bottom. And it says the rocks quaked. So there was, that's another way of saying there was an earthquake. So it seems that at Yeshua's death, there was an earthquake. And then it goes on to say in Matthew 27, that the graves were opened and that many coming out of their graves after his resurrection, that's the key right there, after his resurrection. So it's just a statement of fact, is that when Yeshua died, there was an earthquake. It seems to indicate there that there was, were graves opened at that point. Now, these graves were opened, it says that they came out of the graves after his resurrection. So the question is, were the graves opened at his death, and those were the graves that pe these people were raised out of? Well, there's, there is a couple of challenges that I'm not sure we have the answers for. One is, there seems to have been an earthquake when he died and when he rose. So is this suggesting that these graves that these people were raised from were opened at his death or at his resurrection? I'm not sure we have clear scripture on that, but it doesn't really matter if they were opened but they didn't come out after his resurrection. That's the point really that matters. So one might say, well, they were opened and they were raised uh, and they didn't come out till after his resurrection. Well, there's a dispute on how many days that may have been. Uh, we're not going to get into that. The point being is that they came out of their graves after, their, after his resurrection. Why did that have to happen? Well, number one, he said that he was the resurrection. So once he was raised, and the Bible is clear that the Father raised Yeshua from the dead for a, for a specific reason. That's interesting in itself. But also that he was the one, being the resurrection, that raised the other people. Now, this is very, very interesting. And this is where the Bible becomes a very incredible book because the story is so loaded with information. So what is going on here? Was it just a coincidence that that day this happened? Well, we know that Yeshua fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits, being that grain of wheat that had fallen into the ground, he said himself, unless a grain falls into the ground, it cannot produce much fruit. So he was that grain. He was that first fruits grain that was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. But that wasn't enough, you see, because he had to produce more fruit from his resurrection. And he raised others to life. And they also were, the fir were first fruits. He's fulfilling sanctuary language. And this is, to me, is just beautiful because there's no scripture that says that. But just as there's scripture that says he died or he was crucified 
at the nine o'clock hour in the morning, it says the third hour, which was nine o'clock, and he died at the ninth hour, which is at three o'clock in the afternoon. Scripture doesn't explain that. But when we understand the sanctuary, we can see what's going on. You see, because in the sanctuary service, the lamb was slain. There was a lamb slain at three o'clock at the third hour, which is nine o'clock in the morning. And another one for that continual offering, that two times a day offering at, at the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon. And scripture mentions that those two times in connection with his crucifixion and his death. And that should lead us to say, why does it say that? It's pointing us to the sanctuary. All these things point to the sanctuary. So when Yeshua raises these people, declaring himself in his life to be the resurrection and the life, he does that. He fulfills that when he was raised from the dead by raising others who are also the first fruits. So now the question is, if they are the first fruits, which wasn't a coincidence, there's no way that was a coincidence. He died the very hour the Passover lamb was supposed to die. Was that a coincidence? No, it was not a coincidence. He was raised at the very time that the priest went out into the field and gathered in that wave sheaf of barley to, to start the harvest. That was all had to be done to start the harvest. That's exactly what Yeshua did. He went into the graveyards, not the barley fields where the priests were at that time. He went into the graveyards, which it all represents bringing to life those who are the first fruits. What was the priest supposed to do with those first fruits? The very next morning at the ninth hour, that nine o'clock in the morning, the third hour of the day, the priest was to take that barley sheaf into the sanctuary and to present that before the Lord. So what's going on here? Is this what it's about? Is it about barley or is it about greater events? Well, if we follow the story, he's been resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. He's raised others at the beginning of that day as well. He tells Mary the following morning that he has not ascended to the Father. He had to go to the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's where he went. He said that that's where he's going, to the Father. And he was going to present himself as one raised as the perfect sacrifice. But it was required of the priest that he have a sheaf of barley to show that he had gathered in this barley and the harvest could begin. And so he had to. According to the sanctuary service, he had to take that sheaf of barley to the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is what this question is asking. No, the Bible doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that. But we have to realize what else it doesn't say as well. There's no record of any of those people that were raised. And it says many. We don't know how many that was. It, there's no record of any of those people living the, out their lives here on earth. And I, I would think that maybe some of those people may have written one of the Gospels according to Isaiah or Jeremiah or Seth or Enoch or something. You know, you'd expect to see something like that. But the, it's silent. It's totally silent on that. As if they had been taken away and, and so, according to the sanctuary, this had to be done. This presentation in the Jerusalem temple had to be done. And the idea is that they went into the holy city, but it does not say that they were presented at the sanctuary the next morning when the requirement in the law had to be done. And we know from the book of Hebrews that the whole sanctuary service was a shadow of things to come, and the true sanctuary was in heaven. So if the fulfillment of all of this was really not on earth, the sins, uh, my sins and your sins, cannot be washed away by the blood of a four-legged animal. Only the blood of Yeshua can take away our sins. So this sanctuary was just a typology, a symbol of you will, if you will, of a of greater events. Now the book of Revelation has 
a uh, picture of 24 elders it doesn't say that no I, I take i take it as not saying that they're human beings but it is plausible in the sanctuary service that those could be human beings that were presented it doesn't say that no i wouldn't be dogmatic about it that's what I believe because of what the sanctuary teaches. Also in the book of Revelation, in the later chapters, I believe it's chapter 19 and, and chapter 20, 22, I believe, where John falls at the feet and starts worshiping this glorified being, thinking that it's God. It That's what it seems like because the response comes back, don't worship me, worship God. So it was almost like it appeared to be a divine being. And he was rebuked by this divine being. And he says, he said later on in Revelation 22, it says, I am of your fellow servants, of your brethren, the prophets. So this is a vision uh, of a heavenly vision where he's in communication with this prophet and a fellow servant and a fellow worker. Uh, very plausible, very possible that this could be one that was raised. And somebody said, well, there's no record. You know, we've got a whole list in Hebrews of people in Scripture telling us that no one has ascended to heaven except Yeshua. And we see this in the book of Acts where Peter's uh, talking at Pentecost and saying that uh, David had not ascended to the Father and yet his grave is still there and, and with us to this day. So we, we know that this is the rule. This is the rule that no man has ascended into heaven except Yeshua. But what I'm wondering is if this is the rule and that there are exceptions to the rule. So what are those rules? If we stay true to the sanctuary of we've been talking about is the rule is that you do not go to heaven when you die. In fact, you have to wait till the resurrection until you die. The resurrection when Yeshua returns. But these people broke that pattern and they were resurrected at Yeshua's first coming. And so that's not the rule. This does not happen. This is an exception to the rule. And we carry this on and when we really start to explore this, we can. I think we can see this pretty clear. The widow of Nain had her son brought back to life through Yeshua, raised him from the dead. Now, we don't know how long he lived after that. We don't know the rest of that story. But we can only imagine that he lived his life out with his mother, uh, probably outlived his mother. That's a guess, but probably outlived his mother. The point being is he had a family that he went to. When we have someone else raised, we have another story where Dorcas was raised. Well, she was raised and brought back to her home and, and, and so on, so forth. She knew the people, she knew the surroundings and so on. And we can see that in these stories. Lazarus was the same thing. He was raised and basically given back to his sisters and what I would think would be perfect health and so on but he probably died again. Now, it's interesting in Hebrews, and I just want to read this because I find it interesting. We have a rule in Hebrews, and let's see if we can somehow see that there's possibly an exception to that rule. If we go to Hebrews chapter 9, it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once, and then after this, the judgment. So, let's go back now. It's appointed to man, for man to die once. That's the rule. But are there exceptions? As we've just looked at it, yes, there has to be exceptions, because the widow of Nain's uh, son was raised to die again. The Lazarus was raised, probably to die again. So they have broken the pattern that's laid down in Scripture. So to say that there's no exceptions to the rule is not even keeping with Scripture. 
So is it possible that this was not true for the many that came out of their graves because they had already died once and then after this, the judgment? But we know that the judgment is still yet future to a great degree. So we see my point being in all of this, the rule is that it's appointed for man to die once and that's it. But there are people that when we get to the book of Revelation that are clearly going to have a resurrection that are going to die twice. And it's this second death that tells us in the book of Revelation that has no power. And the reason why it has no power is there's no resurrection from that death. There's no power out of the grave. But these people, like Lazarus, who likely died again, his second resurrection, there's going to be power in it, I would assume, because he's going to be living forever after his second death. So we can see here, Scripture has patterns, and there's rules to those patterns, but at some point, and at some ca- in some cases, God breaks the pattern. And so this is what I see of these that were ra- raised to life at after Yeshua's resurrection, came out of their graves. And again, I say it does not say they went into the sanctuary and presented themselves at the nine o'clock hour in the morning. They had to go according to the pattern, the representation in scripture of the barley that grew out of the ground and produced much fruit. They had to present themselves in the heavenly sanctuary. And there's no record of any of those people living out their lives. So, so do we want to be dogmatic about this? No, I don't want to. I'm just explaining my position, why I believe uh, what I believe. Does it change my ideas of what Yeshua is able to do? No, it doesn't actually. It builds my faith in his ability to produce a greater harvest. That's what the sanctuary service was to do. It was to It was to produce fruit in us that we see that the bigger picture, the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world, the bigger picture in the sanctuary will be fulfilled because of the types that are laid down in the sanctuary. That's what it does to me. So it it has a positive effect on me uh, in my experience um, with the Word and with our Father. So I think I've... I've covered that as as uh, well as I can at this point. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but we did talk about the first fruits and those being part of the first fruits without um, saying there's a couple interesting things. I've got a couple of slides I just want to share on this topic. Uh, the first fruits at Passover were those first fruits that were raised at Yeshua's um, showing the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, them being the first fruits of the harvest, showing that there would be a greater harvest down down the road uh, at his second coming when he would return in person to resurrect all those that believed in him. Uh, They being the first fruits in time as well. Uh, We've got other presentations that demonstrate that that resurrection harvest has to happen at Passover as laid down in the sanctuary service. There's also, um, it talks about no unleavened bread being seen during during this. This, this we could talk a, a lot about this. But it's interesting that the unleavened bread here, the leaven is symbolic of sin. So here one, one could say sin is always uh, talked in the terms of leaven. But we can see here that sin is not always talked in as far as leaven is concerned. So here we say, speak to the children of Israel, saying to them, when you come into the land which you give, which I give to you and reap the harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of the harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. Uh, the priest shall wave it. So this is a first fruits offering, the one that we've been talking about, and so on. And this is uh, Matthew 21. We've covered this pretty well, talking about these people coming out of their graves, bottom point, 
Matthew 27, 51 to 53. And it says, And the graves were open when the rocks were split, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of their graves after his resurrection, uh, they went into the holy city. This, in my mind, is proof we're talking about the first fruits, because they came out after his resurrection. And in other words, they came to life after his resurrection. So these being the first fruits. Now we have a second first fruits that a lot of people uh, forget about. And this first fruits, these two loaves at Pentecost, very interesting, they were baked with leaven. Big difference here between the two feasts. One has no leaven, one is fully leavened. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves uh, of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. We go from Passover, seven weeks down the road. Now we've got uh, fully baked cakes. What are they? It's representing the fully baked uh, apostles ready to preach the last message. And, and of course, we have shown in the last presentation that these are, I believe, the 144,000, where in Revelation chapter 14, it calls them the first fruits. Not to be confused with the Passover first fruits, these are the first fruits uh, that were fully baked with leaven. And it's interesting, we're going to look at something else Yeshua said that I found quite interesting here in a moment. But it says, the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Jehovah with two lambs. They shall be holy to Jehovah for the priest. So at the ascension, after Yeshua comes, he will wave these before the Lord, of course, in the heavenly Jerusalem. Yeshua said something very interesting, I find very interesting here in Matthew 13, 33. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. So this is, you know, I've always looked at this as just, you know, just off the cuff, Yeshua saying something, you know, once the kingdom of heaven gets into you and it grows and grows and grows to you until you're completely leavened. This is this is the typology of the sanctuary, the first fruits being those that the kingdom of heaven has grown in them until it was all leavened. This is the filling up of the Holy Spirit. And I want to just go back to what Jordan Peterson said. If we actually let the kingdom of heaven grow to its full extent, he was left without words to explain where we could arrive at. And this is, this is really what Yeshua is saying here. If we will allow the kingdom of heaven to grow in us to the full extent and let it take over our lives, there is no limit to what God can do in and through us. And I want to encourage all of us to keep pressing forward even in the face of opposition. It's that old saying, make your face like flint. And I say, keep your head into the wind because that's when the progress is made in our Christian experience. Just keep on going.